ValveTime.net. Hi, and welcome to a spooky Halloween special edition of Valve Time Database. In this extra creepy episode, we're going to be taking a look at one of the most iconic and infamous locations from the entire Half-Life series, the desolate mining town of Ravenholm. It's a fan favorite location and for good reason, so it's definitely the perfect choice for the first location we're going to be discussing here on Database. And what better time than Halloween? <laughs> Let's get on with it. Introduced in Half-Life 2, the town and its surrounding graveyards, mines, and tunnels function as the primary locations within the game's sixth chapter, appropriately named We Don't Go to Ravenholm. The town, like locations all throughout the Half-Life 2 saga, is located somewhere in Eastern Europe, possibly near Belgrade, the capital city of Serbia, also known as City 17. While it's never clearly shown or explained, Ravenholm is likely located somewhere around 30 kilometers to the east of City 17, if not more, a journey taken by Gordon Freeman which comprises much of the game's first act and day. Aside from the more obvious environmental contrast with City 17, the appearance and layout of Ravenholm provide an excellent contrast to the rest of the game. Unlike City 17, which features a vast amount of large-scale architecture such as apartment complexes, Ravenholm is comprised mostly of smaller, more densely packed houses and factories built from more traditional materials such as wood and brick. This of course fits Ravenholm's nature as a relatively remote mining town prior to the Combine invasion in the early 21st century. As a densely packed, zombie-infested town, Ravenholm was at least partially inspired by the sealed section within the old quarter of Thief, the Dark Project. While it definitely wasn't the first zombie-infested town, this theory is supported by the fact that Tom Leonard, the designer lead for Ravenholm's level and AI, previously worked on Thief prior to being hired by Valve. And while the sealed section was designed by Randy Smith, it's still quite likely that some elements of the location, or Thief in general, crept into Half-Life 2. It should also be noted that Thief the Dark Project was, at one point at least, Mark Laidlaw's favorite PC game, and it's certainly not uncommon for game designers to sneak aspects or references from other favorite games into those they themselves create. Given its distance from larger cities and its relatively small size, the town became a perfect refuge for rebels looking to escape the Combine rule. For an unspecified amount of time up until the opening chapters of Half-Life 2, the Resistance used a network of underground stations known as the Underground Railroad to help citizens flee City 17 before reaching Black Mesa East and Ravenholm via a series of canals seen throughout the Root Canal and Water Hazard chapters. Some time prior to Gordon's arrival, the Resistance base within Ravenholm was discovered, prompting the Combine to bombard the area with headcrab shells, large metallic missiles filled with a number of headcrabs. After being deployed and crash landing somewhere near the target destination, the rear of each headcrab shell automatically opens, allowing the parasites within to escape and run amok throughout the nearby area, eventually killing any inhabitants. While headcrab shelling is shown throughout Half-Life 2 and the sequel episodes, the results of such an attack are shown no more prominently than at Ravenholm, where the entire crew of resistant civilians have seemingly been killed. Despite the extremely numerous headcrabs and zombies which fill the streets and mines of Ravenholm, it is very unlikely the entire populace of the town were killed, as survivors such as Father Grigori may have fled the area towards Black Mesa East or the coast as the shelling began. That said, the death toll for the shelling must have been insanely high, forcing Black Mesa East to seal a connecting tunnel to Ravenholm in order to stop a possible spread of headcrabs. It would also appear Black Mesa East and Shorepoint Base deliberately damaged the elevators and equipment linking either base from the town, showing the extent to which the Resistance were willing to go to further blockade Ravenholm. Despite this, it would appear the machinery contained within Ravenholm is still powered from somewhere other than the town itself, likely from the dam used to power Black Mesa East as passed during the final moments of the Water Hazard chapter. This would mean the power grid used to power lights and traps within the town is still wired up to Black Mesa East despite being sealed off months or years prior to Gordon's arrival. Prior to shelling, the town and its surrounding areas remained hidden from the Combine for a number of years, potentially over a decade before being discovered. This means that, unlike most of Half-Life 2's locations, Ravenholm appears extremely normal, that is, almost entirely untouched by advanced Combine technology. This would imply that, other than headcrab shells and possible air reconnaissance, it is likely no Combine personnel or military unit has ever stepped foot near the town, making it something of a rarity in a world almost entirely controlled or destroyed by the Universal Union. 
Ravenholm as a target actually provides a relatively good early example of the Combine's might, as the lack of any kind of invasion proves just how powerful their military capabilities can be given the right scenario, allowing them to wipe out an entire area and make it totally uninhabitable without ever having to endanger their own troops or technology. As we mentioned earlier, the famous Father Grigori, also referenced to as the Mad Monk, stands as the only known survivor of Ravenholm and also stands as one of the main elements that fans remember from their time in Ravenholm. Grigori's loud personality and religious outlook was brought to life by actor Jim French, who has since went on to voice the Fisherman in Half-Life 2 Lost Coast, Bill Overbeck in the Left 4 Dead series, and Elder Titan in Dota 2. Jim was identified by Valve while voicing the, quote, evil scientist guys during the development of Sierra's Gunman Chronicles, as confirmed by Half-Life lead writer Mark Laidlaw back in 2012. Grigori's face, however, was brought about by totally different means. As many Valve fans know, a lot of characters from their realistic titles are based off scans of real-world actors or personalities, and Grigori is no exception. During the development of Half-Life 2, an artist known as Toria Dosio regularly invited his father Daniel Dosio to the Valve offices for visits. Half-Life 2's art director Victor Antonov thought his mug would fit the character best before the game's producer, Bill Van Buren, offered him a role in the game. Numerous reference photographs were then taken and used to create an in-game likeness as shown by the ridiculously uncanny resemblance between Daniel and Grigori. Daniel has since gone on to work as the art director for Arianet's Guild Wars 2 MMORPG, meaning the art style of one of the world's most popular MMOs was likely influenced by the real-world likeness of a possibly mad survivalist monk. Now, back to Ravenholm itself. Over what was likely years, sections of the town were sealed off one at a time in order to break up the narrow streets into various zones, presumably making it far easier to contain the slower, less mobile species of zombies. While Gordon shows how many areas can still be navigated relatively easily by humans, most zombies clearly lack both the cognitive ability and physicality necessary to scale the various ladders, walls, lifts, and traps that litter the town. It's never really touched upon in game, but it's possible these walls were erected by the town's inhabitants in order to slow the spread of head crabs and zombies throughout the town as the combine shelled more and more areas, though we feel it's more likely these barricades were constructed, at least partially, by Father Grigori in order to make it easier to control and cull zombies en masse. There's certainly no denying the design and creation of the numerous traps spread throughout Ravenholm, as Grigori explains they are the result of a man who once had too much time on his hands and now only finds time for the work of salvation, suggesting he may have become a self-appointed priest sometime following the Combine shelling. It's possible other individuals within the town assisted with his creation of the traps before escaping, being killed, or being zombified. This is hinted at through several of Grigori's random voice lines, including I still remember your true face and numerous references to his flock, implying Grigori personally knew and interacted with many of the inhabitants of Ravenholm before its fall. Ravenholm and its inhabitants didn't always take on their current form, however, as proven by the infamous leak of Half-Life 2 source code in 2003. Like almost every component of Half-Life 2, Ravenholm underwent major changes throughout the six-year development cycle, including shifts to the town's environmental setting, purpose, thematic tones, relevance, and a whole lot more. Ravenholm and its surrounding areas went through many different names over the course of development, including Town, Zombie Town, Fizz Town, Quarry, Quarry Town, and the most well-known Trap Town, amongst possible other unknown titles. Presumably, one of the first versions of Ravenholm, simply known as Town, stood as just a dark, dreary mining town focused on what Mark Laidlaw described as claustrophobic streets, the teetering buildings, and the oppressing sky. At this stage, Father Grigori was created as an obsessive inhabitant who lobbed grenades and molotovs from a church tower to help the player through a town. It wasn't until the Source Engine's physics systems began to be implemented that the designers started creating environments to take advantage of traps and physical objects, eventually transforming Ravenholm into Trap Town, as shown in the famous E3 2003 gameplay demo. We'll come back to that version in a moment, as it would appear numerous other iterations exist between it and Town. While it's hard to imagine Ravenholm in anything other than a nighttime setting, it would appear the location was bathed in sunlight just as much, if not more, than moonlight. It's not entirely clear why Valve were attempting to experiment with creating a horror setting using a daytime environment, but hey, why don't we ask Left 4 Dead 2 the same question? The focus on daytime is shown heavily in a trio of work-in-progress versions found within the Half-Life 2 leaked files, including Quarry Town, Zombie Town, and Canals. As one of the largest known versions and one of the most visually striking, Quarry Town appears to be a large industrial town filled with mining equipment in the middle of a mountainous area of the wastelands. 
It's believed Quarry Town dates back to around 2001, which explains why the location appears vast and largely open, not claustrophobic or uncomfortable. Much of the architecture and environmental themes seen throughout Quarry Town are extremely similar to those seen in the industrial areas of Half-Life 2 Episode 2, while some streets do appear quite similar to areas seen in the final retail version of Ravenholm. The focus on large industrial vehicles is continued in several other basic maps referred to as Quarry, thought to be featured in the same version as Quarry Town as a crashed cargo train and a placeholder quarry truck can be seen throughout the quarry alongside an odd conveyor belt puzzle. One version that lacked the large vehicles but kept the industrial theme is Zombie Town, a very large, rather empty, and clearly unfinished wasteland town which featured a small handful of zombies. As one of the earliest and most unfinished versions of Ravenholm, Zombie Town is actually quite interesting as it clearly originates from a time before the Eastern European setting of Half-Life 2 was fully nailed down. It's known one of the original proposed locations for the game was the United States of America, something supported by numerous signs and cars seen throughout the town. They all clearly show that this particular version of Ravenholm, and likely the rest of Half-Life 2 as well, were to take place somewhere in or near a desert or wasteland within the US, with one sign reading Springfield, next three exits. It's unclear if Springfield was set to even feature as a location in Half-Life 2 or if this was simply a placeholder sign. Unlike the damaged, undrivable vehicles shown throughout the retail version of Half-Life 2, the cars shown in Zombie Town appear damaged but functional, much like the trucks we previously spoke about which were set to be used in Half-Life 2 Episode 4, which we'll come back to in a bit. Likely, the most unusual version of Ravenholm is simply referred to as canals. While these canals technically only function as the entrance to Ravenholm, this small map shows how the player was going to enter the town straight from the sewer canals during the daytime, rather than first passing through Black Mesa East in the evening before arriving at Ravenholm by nightfall. Unlike Quarry, which features no enemies at all, and Zombie Town, which only features a handful of zombies, Canals actually features a number of headcrabs in rooftops and walkways, likely foreshadowing the zombie-infested town the player was about to enter. All of these early versions brings us to the most widely loved pre-release version of Ravenholm, Trap Town, the believed near final version shown during the Half-Life 2 gameplay demo at E3 2003. Like the final Ravenholm, Trap Town takes place during and shortly after dusk, and much of the town's layout appears very similar to the locations present in the final version, albeit slightly less polished. One of the most interesting things about this version is the combine presence seen throughout the level. Throughout the E3 demo, Combine soldiers are shown patrolling the streets and rooftops throughout the town, but it's not entirely clear if the scripted action sequences from the demo were placed there purely to show off more of the physics engine, or if the Combine were at any point set to feature a real presence within areas of Ravenholm. Another one of the major distinguishing factors between Trap Town and Ravenholm is the appearance of a large, damaged dock on the coast of an ocean or lake. After many different iterations, this area did not appear in the final version of Ravenholm and was cut from the game entirely. It's widely believed that this dock area was to feature as the entrance to Ravenholm, and remnants of the connection between the docks and Ravenholm can still be seen in the final version of Half-Life 2. After getting off the dock and reaching the walls of the town, the player was to take an L-shaped alleyway into Ravenholm itself, where they would exit close to the first meeting with Father Grigori included in the final game. After being scrapped, the entrance from the dock was quite literally fenced up and made inaccessible, but the area beyond the fence still features the same layout and brushwork as it did in the scrapped dock version, while the dock itself was obviously replaced by the entrance to Ravenholm we have all known for the past 10 years. While the entire design philosophy and impact of Ravenholm changed massively over time, it's clear some ideas remained relatively untouched from their first conception to the final iteration we've had for the past decade or so. This can be seen most prominently within certain pieces of concept art, including this piece, which was released alongside a Final Hours of Half-Life 2 themed article on GameSpot back in 2004. The scenario depicted in the concept art will appear familiar to anyone who has played through Ravenholm, as the structure of the apartment sequence shown hasn't actually changed all that much. The few changes that were made include closing off the stairwells, removing the ground floor clinic, removing the appearance of black head crabs in the street, and taking out a child body hidden under a bed, which is obviously a consequence of removing children from the game's narrative altogether. From the rooftop, however, the sequence is eerily familiar, as the player must fight past hordes of zombies, speak with Grigori on the roof to obtain the shotgun, then jump across the street into an open-air water tower before climbing a pair of ladders to reach a rooftop. Several other mechanics also survived throughout much of the design process, including the propeller trap shown multiple times here, while some were featured heavily early on before being removed entirely. 
The most famous cut piece required Gordon to destroy a combined Big Mama pod using a large digger in the Ravenholm mines. The Big Mama pod, which merely appeared as three placeholder advisors in the unfinished files, essentially functioned as a captured Gonark strapped to combine technology, which would force the Gonark to breed as a means of flooding the surrounding areas with innumerable headcrabs, effectively filling in the same role as the shelling raids in the final game. After the Big Mama pod was cut for unknown reasons, the digger and all focus on larger mechanical vehicles disappeared forever, leaving only much smaller, less elaborate, and more believable traps in their place, such as the well-known propeller, propane, and electric traps. Given how Ravenholm continues to stand as one of the community's most well-loved locations, if not the most, it's not surprising Valve decided it was worth revisiting the location in a substantially different form in Arcane Studios' now-cancelled Return to Ravenholm, a game better known as Half-Life 2 Episode 4. As the work in progress title suggests, Ravenholm was to feature as the main location for an unknown protagonist to visit for an unspecified reason. We've covered Half-Life 2 Episode 4 a lot in the past, so we're not going to go into too many details here. However, it is important to note that the version of Ravenholm set to appear in Episode 4 was likely going to appear much larger in order to accommodate more locations in a standalone title. As shown by these in-engine screenshots dating back to sometime around 2007, Ravenholm was to feature much larger concrete buildings such as a hospital, something not even remotely alluded to during Gordon's visit in Half-Life 2. The hospital locale and absorption option on the in-game HUD both reference an unconfirmed central game mechanic possibly related to radiation, some kind of otherworldly energy, or some kind of airborne infection. For way more information about the scrapped, non-canon version of Ravenholm, check out our previous Valve Time Spotlight exclusive episodes as we go into a lot more detail over there. Speaking of non-canon appearances, a massively altered version of Ravenholm also appeared in the Japanese Half-Life 2 Survivor arcade game as Mission 2 of three main mission mode maps. In reality, the only real similarities between Ravenholm and its arcade counterpart are visually and thematic, as the Mission Mode variant is actually a totally custom map which has players damage explosive packs held within zombie houses in order to destroy them. Once activated, each house spawns an endless wave of zombies, fast zombies, and poison zombies, which strangely lack poison headcrabs. A unique zombie also makes an appearance, one that explodes upon being killed in a fashion similar to the Boomer of the Left 4 Dead series, just without the bile and everything. Killing zombies and destroying the zombie houses award the players with points to add to their high score total, while destroying a specific house close to the end of the mission will spawn an unusually mute Grigori as an NPC assistant, who will fight alongside the player much like the original Ravenholm. A modified version of the quote-unquote real version of Ravenholm does make an appearance elsewhere in the arcade game during the third chapter of the story mode. While substantially shorter than the full version of Ravenholm featured in Half-Life 2, the sequence actually features a number of pre-rendered cutscenes used to fill in most of the gaps, such as much of Father Grigori's dialogue and Gordon's eventual escape. And that's quite literally all we have to say about Ravenholm for now. Hopefully you've enjoyed this extra long, spooky special Halloween edition of Valve Time Database. Obviously, the episode itself wasn't all that terrifying, but there's definitely no better Valve location to discuss for Halloween, except maybe Man Manor, that is. Be sure to leave suggestions for future database episodes in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date with all the latest Valve news. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.